The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on you when the good part is shifting to you. Do everything in love. Put on the full armor of God, for on the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. After you have done everything to stand, Ephesians six thirteen. Jesus looked straight at them and said, There are some people that don't know. There's Jesus. Jesus looked straight at them and said, There are some people that don't know some things, but God knows everything. Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Honor thy father and thy mother, for this is right. No, children, obey your parents, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, for this is a first commandment with a promise, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children into anger, but bring them up in discipline and in the law. Psalm 119. 97 through 104. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I do not. I hold my feet back from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Psalm 119, verse 105 to 112. 105 to 112. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted, O Lord. Give me a life according to your word. Accept my free will, free will offering of praise and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not stray from your precepts. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not forget your law. Your testimonies are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. Incline my heart to keep your testimonies, and I will do so forever to the end. Amen. Psalm 119, verses 113 through 120. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise, that I may live, and let me not be put to shame in my hope. Hold me up, that I may be safe, and hold regard for your statutes continually. You spurn all those who go astray, for their cunning is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross, therefore I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. For those of you who have not been to Camp Emmanuel, I would strongly recommend that you go, even for a half a day. Go and see what God is doing with the children, with the youth, with the teens there. The work that Sister Anna and Brother Grigore or Uncle Grigore have done from the beginning is such a nice and such an amazing work. If you have your Bibles, let's open them. And then we're going to start this morning. I hope you're ready to hear the Word of God together. We have a wonderful and amazing theme. We're continuing on the theme of God's goodness that leads us to repentance. And we're going to read from Romans chapter 5, just a couple of verses. And then we're going to get started. I'm re reading from the New Living Translation, the NLT. This is the Bible that I have. It says in verse 6 of Romans chapter 5, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Verse 8, And God showed his great love for us by sending him, by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, again. And verse 11 says, Now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. You may remain seated. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we can hear your word even this morning. As the song says, you are working even when we don't see that you're working. You are working even when you don't feel that you're working, and when you don't feel it, Heavenly Father. And in this morning, we thank you that your spirit is bringing us closer. I want to thank you for the word that will be preached, Heavenly Father. Anoint 
us this morning, all of us, not just the one who's speaking, but all of us, that we would hear your word and that we would understand it and fulfill it in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. It is an absolute joy to be here this morning. I want to bring greetings from across the Atlantic Ocean, from our friends and family in Germany and also those in Austria. We had a wonderful time together. And before I want to start this morning, I want to thank God, not only for uh, Brother Charlie again, but for the work that he's doing in China. We don't see it. The state government and the state media in China will never tell us. But we know that the Holy Spirit is working in China as well. It's working in Iran, or he's working in Iran, and he's working here in Royal Oak, he's working in Romania. And what gives me hope, and Charlie, I never told you this, but I'll tell you again, because we were at a church together with my dad in Dubai. The church was probably from the door to here. It wasn't very big. It was an upstairs room at a Holiday Inn hotel. That's where they met. It was probably maybe four meters wide, as wide as the stage is. And together with the faithful from China, from Iran, from Nigeria, from Pakistan, from India, from the U.S., from the UAE, Together with all of them, we worship and praise the Lord. And my heart was joyful because, Charlie, you have a beautiful voice, but he was singing loud like the Chinese brothers and sisters in the Dubai were singing loud. Some of them were singing really nice, some not so nice, but it's okay because all of it was for God's glory. So we really uh, were encouraged, my dad and I, before we went to India, we stopped in Dubai. And uh, actually, the reason I wanted to say it is because Pastor Johnson... Um, who was there, a young man, he reached out to me on on, uh, WhatsApp again. And I don't know what God's going to do. I really don't. There's so much work that we can do for him. You saw the work that we're doing in Malawi, Sister Blessings is continuing to do in Eastern Europe, in Romania, and and in uh, Bulgaria, and in Moldova, and in Ukraine as well. All over the world, God is using a handful of people here to proclaim the gospel message. And for that, I want to say praise God. Praise God for it. Praise God for it, even right now. Thank God for it. So as we start this morning, I want us just to to clear our minds. We have a a couple of points that I'd like to get through. And and like I said, we are continuing in this theme of God's goodness that leads us to repentance. And the title for this morning's message is Because He, Because God is Faithful, Because Jesus is Faithful, Because He is the Faithful Witness, Because the Holy Spirit is Faithful and Good, we respond because his faithfulness, and by the way, we want to greet all of you in Kenya, Director Teresa, Pastor Timothy, for the work that you're doing there. For those of you, and I mentioned before, I just came from Austria, but if you're watching all over the world, wherever you are, we greet you this morning, and we want to proclaim God's goodness. And I want to say for all of us here that this time that we have, the time that we listen, the time that we hear the testimonies, the time that we have of worship, All of this is bringing us closer to him and to the time at the end of the service when we can respond in prayer because it's so great and it's so amazing. I want to thank the Lord for second chances. I want to thank the Lord for third chances and fourth chances. I want to thank the Lord that the Bible says the righteous person may fall seven times. He may stumble. He may slip. He may may lose his balance. He may fall into temptation. But he gets up with the power of the Holy Spirit, even if he falls seven times. And it's, it's hard to fall seven times. I fell off my bike in Rockford, Michigan, and I cracked my clavicle into four places. And it was very tough to get up. But even when we fall and we hit ourselves pretty hard, we can get up. And we thank God for these second chances. And the reason I say this is because I had the opportunity to preach the gospel in a small town called Matighofen, Austria last Sunday and I missed the main point of the entire message. I was rushed. I had to get to Germany and there were other people that were waiting to exhort and to encourage the people. So I I rushed and I didn't need to rush, but I rushed and I forgot the main message, which is the message that we're going to proclaim this morning. So I want to thank God for giving me life to give me another day that I can preach the gospel, and we can all learn something together this morning. So thank God for the second chances that he gives us, that he gives us. And my message was this, and it was the end of the sermon, it was the culmination or the exhortation, and I forgot it, but I thank God that I have a chance to say it now. The greatest proof of God's faithfulness to us 
to the Romanians, to the Americans, to the Chinese, to the Iranians, to all of us, to the Syrians. The greatest proof of his faithfulness to us is the good news, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a proof that we need to understand. Charlie was talking about getting good grades in school. When I was in school, we learned in mathematics what a proof is. A proof is, I'm going to make it very simple, if A is equal to something and B is equal to the same thing, that means that A and B are the same. But beyond math, when we get into our spiritual lives and we think deep in our hearts and we connect with God, we realize something. And we realize that God's plan is amazing and that his plan and his faithfulness has brought to us the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't need to do it. I'm going to say it again. I said it last time or two Sundays ago that God could have easily sent the angel of death again. But he didn't do that. He had a promise and he kept his promise. And because of that, we are so thankful this morning that this is the truth. And it says in Hebrews chapter 10, an encouragement for you, my brother, an encouragement for you, my sister, that we should hold fast, hold fast on the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He can be tr trusted to keep his promises. You know, we live in a world, and you guys know this, for those of you who have families and have lived and work in industry, we live in a world where we hear a lot of promises. I can do this for you, I can help you, I promise I'll do it. But in the end, these promises fall short and we are left with nothing. And when we are left with nothing in our hands, we should do as we sing. We should give God the greater glory, and I come to you empty-handed. And even empty-handed, God accepts us because he is faithful in doing that. And so many times we're, we're maybe frustrated because we think it shouldn't be this way. Life should be different. God, I want you to work differently in my life. But for all things, God has a purpose and a plan. And this morning, I want to bring in two themes that we know about, but I've been praying and I've been searching my heart and, and searching God's heart for this point, that God's faithfulness and his goodness work hand in hand. We sang this morning, holy, holy, Lord Almighty, good and gracious, good and gracious King. And I was thinking, as I was listening in the song that was prepared by the worship team, by Sister Bianca and Brother Utsu and Brother Isaac, I, we could have sang, Holy, Holy, Lord Almighty, good and faithful King. Not good and gracious, even though he is good and gracious. We can also say good and faithful. We can say good and loving. But good and faithful go hand in hand. And that is the gospel message. And as Bianca was praying and her heart was being searched by the Holy Spirit, she said toward the end of her prayer that there's so many people, so many people that are lost and that are completely bankrupt in this world, not in their bank account or at their home, but they're bankrupt and they're corrupted in their soul. What do we do for these people? What do we do? We can pray, we did. We can preach the gospel message and then we're going to show you something at the end that will help them to open their eyes and understand that God's faithfulness and his goodness work hand in hand and that it causes us to do something. It compels. I love that word in English. I don't know what the word is in Romanian. Aforza uh, maybe is the word in Romanian, but in English to compel is to almost to, to push somebody, to, to help them understand, to oblige somebody to do something. And because of that, we know that God is working and that he's tugging at our hearts. And for that this morning, we say, thank you, Jesus. This morning, we continue with the song that we sang at the Easter celebration. How many of you were here last Sunday night? I wasn't here, so I can't raise my hand. How many of you are here? We sang the song, In Christ Alone. I love that song. There's so many beautiful hymns, and I think about the psalmist, and David, who commanded the Levites to sing, for his mercies endure forever, for his loving kindness endures forever. That's what they sang. That's how they worshiped the Lord. And this morning we did the same thing and we felt the presence of God. But in this song, in Christ alone, it says, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm, firm. 
We live in a world where we may invest in, in Bitcoin and we see all of our investment go to nothing. We may invest in Charlie Smiling because we talked about this. We may put our trust in some other person or institution or a political party. And in the end, we, we have nothing to show for it. Things not only stay the same, but they get worse. We want things to get better and they get worse. But I have good news for you and those of you who are watching online this morning that the solid ground that we have is Jesus Christ and we stand on him. And this goodness and this faithfulness that God shows through us is really the solid ground on which we stand. It is. It really is. And the reason why I say this is because God's heart is for humanity. It says in John 3.16, we know this verse that God so loved the world that he sent his son. It's very basic. It's very, uh, Lemmy, we already know this. But the firmness of this foundation cannot be shaken. The firmness and the foundation on which we stand and listen closely is not the law of Moses. It's good to know the law of Moses. It's good to, to understand it and to, to try to keep it. It's, it's good to understand other things and other main principles, I would say, within the Bible. But in my heart and the way that I understand the message of God and the gospel the firmness of the foundation is based truly on God's faithfulness. When we were together with our dear friends at the Summit Church, who uh, I talked to Pastor Ovi, and he sends his greetings, by the way, we had a sermon series, Your Last Sermon. In my last sermon that I would have preached if I was old and my days were coming to an end and I knew that my time was short, would be that God remains faithful. That was the theme of this sermon. And the more I think about it, now at 44 years old, I rethink and I look at my children and I look at the, the teens that we grew up with that now are married and have their own children and life goes by. And I think of God's faithfulness as really the only constant that there is applicable in our lives. There's other things, of course, but he is above all things. He's, he's not troubled by us. He's not troubled by the things that may be happening. If we think about the universe and the creation of his hand, he knows all of it. And then the psalmist says so beautifully as he's worshiping the Lord, I think in Psalm 8 or Psalm 9, he says, who am I that you would think of me? Who am I? But God does think about us. And because he thinks about us and because he loves us and because he is good and faithful, he sent Jesus for us. And that's the gospel message. That's the message of hope that we want everybody to hear. Not just our children. It's good that our children hear that. It's good that our friends hear that. But it's better if all of us can hear the gospel message together. So when life gets shaky, when you get that pink slip, in America we say it's a pink slip, let me thank you for your service, but no thank you. When you make that bad investment and you don't know where to turn because you've lost almost everything. Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and with the eyes of your heart, turn towards Jesus and turn towards the faithfulness and the goodness that God has embodied in Christ and put your faith in him. Don't put your faith in the things of this world. Don't do it. Don't put your faith in your 401k or in fidelity is where our work has our, our future plans and who knows what the future will be? Who knows? The wars that are going on and continuing in, in Ukraine, and we pray for our brothers and sisters there, and we, we see the strife in the Middle East. We see so many problems, and we think, what's going to happen? But the truth is that this firm foundation that we stand upon, even this morning, is Jesus Christ. And it says here, the cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest storms. Firm through the fiercest trials is Jesus Christ and his faithfulness and his goodness continues to be shown to us every single day. I was praying and uh, yesterday I was driving back with Ligia, my dear wife. We were at a wedding, a beautiful wedding. And just a small parenthesis, as we say in Romanian, a small parenthesis. It's so good to see two young people that love each other get married in the house of the Lord and dedicate their lives to one another for the rest of their lives. I'm going to say that's very good. 
I'm going to leave everything else to the side, and I'm going to encourage my children and those who are listening to do the same so that we can remain in God's will. I think so many times about this beautiful country that we live in. God has given us the United States of America, and I think about China and these wonderful countries and and people that have a life and and they're planning and, and doing something for the future, and I think about those that don't have anything. And I think about what am I better with, and I'm not better in anything. And as we were driving yesterday, I was praying and thinking and doing some research, and I found a verse. I found a verse, the psalmist. It's actually Psalm... Uh, written by David, Psalm 145. It's a beautiful psalm. And because we only have a couple more minutes, about 10 more minutes before we pray this morning, I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but listen to what the psalm says. This is Psalm 145, verse 12. The Lord is faithful in all his words. So if God says something, be sure that it's going to come to pass. It may not come to pass right away. So many people prophesied about the Messiah, about Jesus Christ, And they died without seeing it. They died without seeing it. I think of Simeon who took up Jesus in his arms at the eight-day circumcision ceremony that they had. And he said, Lord, I can rest now because I have seen the salvation of Israel. In fact, I have seen the salvation of the nations. So some people did see the promise. Many people did not. God is faithful in all his words and is kind in all his works. Isn't that amazing? He's faithful, and he's kind. He's faithful, and he shows his goodness. And I thought, this is so amazing. This is so great because it continues to show us that God is reaching out through the Holy Spirit, through his, through his, uh, through his sovereignty. I was going to say through his grace. It is through his grace, but through his sovereignty. And I think... As we prayed this morning at the time of prayer for a young lady from Bulgaria, a young Roma girl, I would say, and I prayed for her and I said, Lord, show yourself to her. We probably don't speak the same language. She probably speaks the Roma language or Bulgarian. I I can't even talk to her. But God knows how to talk to her. He knows how to send Jesus in a dream or through a song or through a verse or through a billboard as we prayed earlier today so that she can see God's faithfulness and his goodness. In all his works, the Bible says that we are the work of his hand. So God shows his kindness to the work of his hand. And going back to the first verses that we read as we shift into a different gear this morning, God shows this even while we were still sinners. Even when we were still far away from God. Even still when we hated God. He showed his love for us. And that's very difficult for us to understand. It's very difficult because when someone shows hatred towards us, if someone shows hatred towards our children, we, we love our children. They're not perfect, but they're our children. And when someone goes out of their way to be vengeful and spiteful and angry and maybe even violent, it's really difficult to show that person love. But again, this verse from Romans chapter 5 and One day, I hope that we will go through the book of Romans, maybe spend a year or two and go through every single verse and understand that this is one of the underlying factors of this book because it talks about when we were still sinners. Verse number six says, when we were utterly helpless. That's the NLT translation, utterly helpless. When we were completely gone, Christ came at not the wrong time. He came at just the right time. So many times in our lives we say, Lord, I want you to work right now. In German, right now is jetzt. Jetzt gleich. I want you to work right now. And he doesn't work the way that we think. And we've been reading and praying and listening to Jim Elliott's widow and hearing how she prayed before God and how things happened in her life that she did not understand. But one thing that was so amazing about this woman is that she always deferred to God's faithfulness and to his goodness. That's extremely hard to do. For us, in this human nature, this carne, this flesh, it's not possible. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be filled to the brim of God's love. And you may say, Lemmy, I don't know how to do that. We're going to find out this morning how to do that. But I, I just love this verse. I love how God is speaking to us 
and how he, he brings this together. And I always say this, that the Bible is completely connected. It really is. If we talk about forgiveness, which we have at no cost, the Bible will show us so many examples of the forgiveness that God gave us and of the forgiveness that we owe to one another. Charlie, you sinned against me, you asked for forgiveness, and I forgive you. Many times people don't ask for forgiveness. And even when they don't ask for forgiveness, it is our responsibility or our duty to forgive because we forgive because who forgived us? Christ, Jesus forgived us first. And we love because he loved us first. So the Lord is faithful in his words and is kind in all his works. I love it. I, I just want to read the Psalms and keep reading this, the, the Psalms together. So this morning, as we get closer and closer to prayer, the question is this. Brother Chris, Brother Daniel, Brother Greg, let me. How are you going to respond to God's goodness and to his faithfulness combined? How do we respond? Let's take a simple example in our normal lives. We've had a really bad day, and my dear uncle Emil said this this morning. Maybe we're outside working in the freezing cold, and someone takes the time to prepare something for us, and we come inside, and it's warm, and things are ready, and just thinking about it, you get a big smile on your face. How do we respond when someone does that for us? We respond and say, thank you. We give them a big hug, and, and we, we share this moment together, but what if I don't respond that way? What if I come in the house and I'm, man, I'm angry. I've been working all day. And the love that you show to me, I just push back right at you. I don't want it. Unfortunately, that's what so many people in the world do to the grace and the faithfulness of God every day. So the question is, how do you respond? How do we respond? And the answer is very simple. And this morning, I want to continue to tie even my former sermons together. We respond this way. Number one, with a change of heart. Number two, with repentance. And number three, with action. We know the verse, which is the foundation of the theme that we're preaching, that God's goodness leads us to repentance. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, do you despise the goodness of God? Do you despise his mercies? Do you not care about his grace? Are you indifferent to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? There are people that are like that, but this morning we are not, and because we are not, we have a chance to change our heart. David says in the Psalms that create, it's a beautiful song, create in me a, a clean heart, a pure heart, a new heart, O God, and renew a, stead, a right and steadfast spirit within me, that's not what we do. That's what God does. That's what happens when we get closer to him, when we make a step towards him, he makes another step towards us. And because God's goodness continues to push us to repentance or, or compels us, we start to act. We start to act. We don't just sit on the couch and say, oh, hallelujah, God's good. Have a good day, buddy. When we were preaching in the theme or in the book of James, there's an amazing verse there that says that when someone is cold and hungry, you can tell them, hey, God bless you, man. Go, go and be fed. Go be warm. That's not how we fulfill the law of Christ. That's not how we do it. He says if you do that, it, it doesn't help. Your, your faith is, is for nothing. So we have to think about these actions. And I put this slide together because I really wanted us to think about it. When God's goodness and his faithfulness are stirred up in our hearts, when we understand this and we move towards repentance, that's why we are compelled to do more for him. In a good thermometer, this is just what I think, and it's maybe true, maybe not true, a good thermometer is just to find out how, how well somebody can help or, or is willing to assist. There are so many things that we do in our lives that, they may not be for the glory of God. They may not be for the goodness of God, but these are the things that we can do, so that's why we're compelled. And I put here as well one of my favorite texts in the Bible, John three seventeen, that says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. So this morning, again, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the action that is within us, we are compelled, we are not condemned. 
We are compelled to act. We are compelled to repentance. We are compelled to get closer to God. But we are not condemned because, as you can see here, the compelling that we are, that the things that we are compelled to do are to, in essence, love one another, to assist one another, to help one another. And that's how we fulfill the law of Christ. And that's why the whole gospel of Jesus Christ is so tied together. It's so connected. So this morning, take a second and ask yourself, am I compelled? Am I in action? Am I doing something to get closer to God? Am I doing something to to bring myself closer, to bring my family closer to God? Am I compelled to show others the goodness of God? Am I compelled to react in a good way and to show others the things that God has prepared for us? And I want to stress this point again because last time on April 7th when I had the opportunity to share the gospel, I said that the Holy Spirit is the comforter and not the condemner. And I want to repeat that point again. The Holy Spirit, when he's working in our hearts, especially, let, let's, take a, let's take an example. We know we're not okay with God. We take a day of fasting or we spend some time together and we go into our closet and we pray. Jesus said for us to go into our closet and we pray. And when we go there, you know what we feel? We feel the presence of God and we feel a comforting spirit. We feel that God knows what we're going through. He knows what we're going through. Maybe our children are far away from the Lord. Maybe I don't have enough money to pay the bills this month. Maybe something else is going on. I want to do something and I can't. And I put this burden on Christ. We sing, he deserves the greater glory. The second verse says that I will give to you my burdens as you continue to work in our hearts. So he is not the condemner. He is the comforter. And this morning we should accept that and thank God for it. And as we get closer to close here, I want us to see this slide again. It's a really nice slide. It's the practical application of the gospel. As an engineer, I always think about how can I apply this practically in what I'm doing? It's really good. Maybe a new company comes in or a new technology, and I think, man, this is actually really neat, but how can I use it? What's the practicality of it? I have really good news for you this morning. Because God is good and because he is faithful and he is our firm foundation, that brings us closer to him. And as we compel or as we are compelled into action, we are compared to this picture here and we see how we can help to carry one another's burdens. It says this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Paul is writing to the Galatians and he says this. It's very simple. He says, carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Fulfilling the law of Christ by carrying one another's burdens. And this fulfillment of the law is the output. It is what comes out of our repentance. A couple months ago, I preached about how God uses the repentance that is in our hearts as we get closer to him to redeem us. To redeem us, of course, from damnation and from eternal hellfire, but also to restore us to restore us to goodness and to to heal our bodies even. That's what it says also in, in Isaiah chapter 53, that we are healed by his wounds. So it's all connected. So this morning, I'm going to go back to the question that I had before for you. What do you think? How is the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God working in your heart? What is the outcome of the things that you have prayed about, that you have fasted for? Because I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters, and with this I want to close. So many times I look at my life and I feel like I'm doing too much. I feel like I'm being pulled into 10 or 15 different directions. I feel like I do so much, I'm trying to do more and more, but I can't. Because these things are are trapping me, they're holding me down. And whenever I feel pulled down, I, I take a break and I say, Lord, what's going on? And by the Holy Spirit, I start to pray. And again, just as Elizabeth Elliot did, I feel the goodness and the kindness of God in my life. And then I I feel restored. I feel renewed. And that gives me the power to continue. And I don't know if you feel like that. Maybe you're past that. Maybe you're in a different stage of life. But in my life, in what I'm going through, I want to share with you that God's goodness and his faithfulness continue even this morning, even right now. Even right now, even at 11.53 a.m. on April 21st, 2024. His goodness continues even right now and his faithfulness continues even right now. And for that, we should be thankful. 
For that we should be uh, overwhelmed with joy. For that we should say, Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on Calvary. Thank you that you had given to us everything that we need. And this goodness is continuing to compel me. And as I get closer to you, you are drawing closer to me. It says that in the book of James. And as we do that, and with this I want to close, those around us will see it. When someone is full of God's goodness and his love and the Holy Spirit, you can see that in their eyes. You can see that in the way they speak. And I want all of us this morning, let's stand as we get ready for prayer. I want all of us this morning to fully understand that, to understand that God's goodness and that his faithfulness are bringing us closer to him. With that, let's close our eyes and let's pray together and then we'll hand the microphone over. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. And we thank you for your word, hallelujah, that you have spoken to us that you have proven to us, hallelujah, even the psalmist has said that you are full of goodness, hallelujah, that you are faithful in all your words and you are good, hallelujah, to all your works. You are kind to all of your works, Heavenly Father. We thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that the word this morning is building us up. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have done, hallelujah, so much for us, hallelujah, that you continue to work in our hearts, Lord, that you continue, Father, that your goodness doesn't end and your faithfulness doesn't end, hallelujah. Thank you for working, Father, and thank you for sharing with us all of the things, hallelujah, that you have already prepared. Your faithfulness, hallelujah, was proven to us. And the proof of this, hallelujah, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is it. Your faithfulness, that you are always faithful, that you will always continue to work in our hearts. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those in around us, Father. We pray for the homes in this region, Father, and in this subdivision. We pray for the city. We pray for this county, Heavenly Father. We pray that you would work and bring us closer and closer to you. Because all of these things, Heavenly Father, are for your glory. Thank you again for the word that was preached this morning. Thank you for our dear brother Charlie for the work that you're doing, hallelujah, among the young people, the Chinese people here in the Detroit area. Thank you, Jesus, that you can do all of these things for all of us, hallelujah, and that we have the time that we have together, Father. Thank you again for your word, and thank you for teaching us, hallelujah, that we need you more and more, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, this morning as we end in a time of prayer, we turn our eyes to you. We turn our eyes away from the things of this world and we turn our eyes to you and we realize your goodness for us. We realize your faithfulness for us. We realize, Father, the grace that was shown on Calvary and we realize that this goodness compels us to get closer to you. Some people don't like the word repentance. They don't like the word penitence. They don't like the word to, to do something else or something. But we this morning, Heavenly Father, understand that it is drawing us near to you. And this morning, as it is drawing us near to you, help us to respond and take another step towards you. And this morning, take another step. And this afternoon, take another step. And this evening, take another step and get closer and closer to you and to be thankful to you. Heavenly Father, for this church, I pray for the leadership of this church. I pray for every single brother and sister that's here this morning. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our children. Thank you for the future. Thank you for those that are close to us and those who are far away. Thank you that you've got a great plan for this church and a great and wonderful understanding that maybe we don't understand right now, but you are ready to work and you are ready to continue your goodness towards us. Father, I want to thank you again in the name of Jesus for your faithfulness. I want to thank you for the goodness that was proven. Thank you for the psalmist that declared that you are faithful and that you are good. Let us understand it with our whole hearts and let us truly bring ourselves to a point where we can get closer to you. Heavenly Father, I ask all these things in Jesus' name, and I thank you again. Amen and amen.